Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harrington. Based on what it looks like around me, it might not seem like an ideal time to talk about butterflies, but I assure you it is. So if I were to ask you to think about butterflies and I asked you to name maybe two or three that you're familiar with, I'll bet that most of you would include the monarch butterfly in that list. And I'm saying that because you've read the title of this video, so monarchs are probably at the top of your mind. And also because the monarch is simply an iconic species, not just for a butterfly, but for any animal. When we talk about conservation in North America, when we talk about native ecosystems, when we talk about threats to species and to native ecosystems, it's difficult to leave monarchs out of the discussion. Now the monarch has been increasing in popularity in recent years in large part because its continued existence in North America as a thriving species is questionable. And that's drawing a lot of attention. Perhaps you've heard that monarch populations have been declining in recent decades and that the US Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing protection by listing the monarch as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Now, many people within ecological circles fully support this listing, and why wouldn't they? If numbers of any native species are dwindling, why not support at least some federal protection? But interestingly, not everyone thinks that this is entirely a good idea, for many reasons. Some ecologists and monarch researchers claim there really isn't a big problem at all. Some people think we should just leave the butterflies alone. Some people believe that well-intended but misguided interventions have caused more problems than they have solved. So what's going on? Are monarchs in trouble? If so, why? And how bad is the situation? Is more intervention a good thing? Should we really be raising monarch butterflies at home? And how does organized crime tie into all of this? Let's find out. To get started and to really begin to understand what's going on, it's important to address the fascinating life cycle of the monarch butterfly. Right now, it's winter in the Northeastern United States. There are no monarch butterflies in this ecosystem right now. They're gone. They were here, but they're somewhere else right now. So where are they? Well, they are in Mexico, specifically in the high elevation Oyamel fir forests of central Mexico. There are monarchs in Florida right now. There are monarchs in California and some other areas. But the majority of monarchs that are in central Mexico right now migrated to there from areas in the US and Canada east of the Rocky Mountains. And these monarchs will overwinter in the mountainous fir forests until about March, which is when they will migrate north to more favorable breeding grounds. Over the span of the subsequent months, from early spring through summer, monarchs will mate, females will lay eggs, eggs will hatch into larvae or caterpillars, the caterpillars will feed and eventually pupate, out of the chrysalis will emerge a butterfly, which will then attempt to mate and perpetuate the cycle. This cycle repeats a few times in one year as the monarch population expands north through the US and Canada. The final generation of adults does not breed in the north, Instead, this generation migrates thousands of miles south to central Mexico to overwinter in the mountainous Oyamel fir forests. Now there's something really important to know about monarchs and their ecology. Monarchs rely on a certain genus of plants during particular parts of their life cycle. And that genus is the milkweed or Asclepius genus. Monarch butterflies lay their eggs exclusively on members of the milkweed genus and the hatched larvae or caterpillars feed exclusively on milkweed. As they feed on milkweed, the caterpillars sequester toxic compounds produced by the plant. These toxins protect the caterpillars and adults from predation, largely by birds. Now, as I mentioned a few times, monarch numbers are declining according to researchers and the media. A likely explanation as to why monarch numbers are declining is that their host plants are declining as well. But is this true? Well, a groundbreaking paper was published in 2023 that attempted to answer this question. The researchers surprisingly found no evidence that either the monarch or common milkweed experienced significant population contractions over the past 75 years. The researchers did find two population expansions of both species in the past, when North American glaciers retreated 10 to 20,000 years ago, 
and when eastern forests were cleared in the 19th century. Andy Davis, a monarch researcher not associated with this study, commented on its findings. There has been no recent decline in the population size of either monarchs or common milkweed. So even though prairies have been plowed under, even though open savannas have transitioned into closed canopied forests, even though croplands have taken over large swaths of the continent and herbicides and pesticides have saturated the landscape, milkweed, or at least common milkweed, is apparently doing okay. And at least according to this study, the monarch species hasn't experienced a catastrophic decline either. What's that about? Especially because all we seem to hear today is that monarch populations are declining and that they must be protected. Well, the short answer seems to be this. The overall summer breeding population of monarchs in North America as a whole isn't declining. And this includes populations in the southeast as well as those west of the Rocky Mountains which typically don't migrate to Mexico. Overwintering populations in central Mexico and California, however, have declined. But when these overwintering populations return to their breeding grounds, they reproduce extraordinarily well and eventually make up for what was lost during the fall migration and winter season. Supporting these statements is a paper published in 2022 which looked at trends in monarch population numbers. While the researchers found declines at some sites, particularly the U.S. Northeast and parts of the Midwest, numbers in other areas, notably the U.S. Southeast and Northwest, were unchanged or increasing, yielding a slightly positive overall trend across the species range. According to this study, the collective breeding population of monarchs in North America is not showing strong evidence of widespread declines. These findings, which probably surprise a lot of people, support the evidence that milkweed isn't declining either. Because remember, milkweed is required by monarchs during the breeding season. Because breeding populations of monarchs in North America are doing okay, their host plants must be doing okay as well. Now remember, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing protection of the monarch by listing it as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Why would they do that? if? What we now know is that the collective breeding population of monarchs in North America is not showing strong evidence of widespread declines. Well, we can't ignore something else, and this something else isn't disputed in the scientific literature or among nearly every single monarch researcher. And that's the fact that overwintering populations of monarchs in central Mexico and California are declining. But why are these overwintering populations declining, specifically in Mexico, which hosts the largest overwintering colonies of monarchs? Well, a number of hypotheses have been proposed, including extreme weather events, herbicide and pesticide exposure, a reduction in the number of nectar plants required by monarchs during their migration, car strikes during the fall migration, anthropogenically created EMFs, and parasites, including one that may be responsible for preventing tens of millions of monarchs from reaching Mexico. Known to researchers as OE, this single-celled parasite spreads quickly when monarchs congregate together, which happens during the fall migration. Interestingly, human activity can exacerbate the spread of parasitic spores. Mass rearing of caterpillars, which people often do at home, widespread planting of exotic milkweed, and the capture of large numbers of monarchs during migration for tagging purposes can spread spores of the OE parasite and contribute to the loss of monarchs in their wintering grounds. Now there's another factor that's commonly implicated in the decline of the overwintering colonies of monarchs in central Mexico. Illegal logging and habitat destruction in the mountainous fir forests of central Mexico. There's no doubt this is happening, but a good question to ask is why is this happening? Answering that question requires that we take a look at another crucial element in the overall story. And that is the indigenous population and local communities that were once allowed to manage those fir forests. You see, when these forests were discovered by scientists in the 1970s, local people, including indigenous people, already knew about these forests. 
Not only did they know about the forests, their entire lives were entwined with them. These forests were, and still are, ritualized commons that require ceremonies to recognize the forest's role as provider of water, timber, non-timber plant sources, animals to hunt, and mushrooms for foraging. After scientists discovered the forests, organizations, including government agencies and nonprofits, got involved and restricted access to these forests by creating a reserve and designating certain parts of the reserve human-free. All of this was explained in an exposition written by monarch researcher Columba Gonzalez Duarte. The reserve was first established on land encompassing a number of local communities. The co-owners of these properties had long employed a traditional land use system by which locals inhabited and cultivated traditional food gardens in the lower hills, while the mountains, where the monarchs overwinter, were managed as forest commons. When organizations came in, land restrictions undermined the use of the forest commons, reducing local land control and precipitating changes in local livelihoods. These restrictions have nurtured a cycle of declining community presence, granting space to organize crime operations in the reserve's core area. Criminal activities, including drug trafficking and illegal logging, have been on the rise inside the reserve. And this new frontier region is riskier for humans, trees, and butterflies alike. That's a big part of the story that many people don't know. Illegal logging, which is occurring in the central Mexican mountainous fir forests, is strongly connected to the recent division that's been created within the local communities. It's a messy situation, and it's difficult to say what can be done about it. But I think it's important to at least acknowledge what's going on and to understand that the monarch story in North America involves not just a butterfly, not just milkweed, not just nectar-producing flowering plants, but indigenous human beings in Mexico and also in the U.S. and Canada as well. As I mentioned a few times, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing to list the monarch as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Not only have overwintering populations in Mexico declined, overwintering populations in California have also fallen. According to entomologists William Snyder and Michael Crossley, the listing would legally protect the groves of trees near the California coast where western monarchs overwinter. And that seems like a good thing. But these same entomologists worry that the encouragement of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to get private citizens involved in helping to rescue a threatened species by raising butterflies could be counterproductive, especially if private citizens raise monarchs on non-native milkweeds that interfere with the fall migration route and exacerbate the spread of the OE parasite. Even the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation recommends against large-scale captive rearing of monarchs for release into the wild due to concerns about the OE parasite. Ultimately, entomologists William Snyder and Michael Crossley recommend concentrating our efforts on the stages where the butterflies are clearly struggling, fall migration and overwintering. A simple thing we can do is plant appropriate types of flowering plants along fall migration routes. Monarch researcher Andy Davis from the University of Georgia echoes some of these same sentiments and encourages people to stop it with the rearing, as monarchs reared in captivity are not as good at migrating. He also encourages people to rewild a section of your own yard and allow the wildflowers to grow as they please. In particular, he mentions that goldenrods are great for migrating monarchs. Of course, not every ecologist, entomologist, biologist, or butterfly enthusiast is in agreement with what's going on or how humans should best proceed. Many people and organizations continue to support the planting of non-native milkweeds and the captive rearing of monarchs. Despite controversial views and differences in belief, I think many of us can find common ground on a few points. That learning what's going on is important, that being observant with what's going on is important, that being in tune with the cycles of nature is important, and that the world could be a much lovelier place if we allowed the wildflowers to grow. Mm -hmm.